Plant Nutrition Sherlock Holmes style. Uh, hopefully you're all here um, to, to learn a little bit more about plant nutrition and trying to take, I'm going to hopefully take some of the mystery out of identifying plant nutrition problems, um, specifically deficiencies, um, and help you be a plant detective, a plant nutrition detective on determining why you're having those deficiencies because identifying the, de the deficiency is really only half of the problem. So we're going to go through a number of different things. Um, we're going to follow this tri triangle here. The first thing is we're going to look at the symptoms, uh, what is caught or what the symptoms look like, how to identify um, the nutrient deficiencies. Then we're going to look at the causes. What are some of the causes that cause the symptoms? Um, and then I'm going to go over the process that I take when I'm trying to identify not only what the symptom is and what's causing it, um, but how to diagnose the cause and, and what we can do to, to remedy it. And finally, uh, we're not going to do the practice today, but practice is a big part of this. This is not something that's going to come naturally. Um, after watching this, this webinar, you're going to have to take these techniques and apply them on a regular basis to put them into your um, long-term memory. So let's, let's go back to symptoms, and we're just going to talk about nutrient deficiency symptoms and identifying those deficiencies. Um, when we're doing this, um, I'm going to go over just recognizing the, the actual symptoms um, broadly, what I mean. Just going to go over some vocabulary. Then we're going to talk about the mobile elements, the partial, um, partially mobile elements, and then finally the immobile elements. Um, oops, wrong way. Sorry about that. So some vocabulary. Um, I kind of stumbled over this uh, for a long time uh, when, when people talk to me about mobile elements and immobile elements. And what we mean by mobile el elements is not only do the elements get taken up by the plant because that's mobility, but what we mean by mobility is can they be reallocated throughout the plant? So they move into the leaves and can the plant move those elements out of the out of those leaves and into different parts of the plant. That's mobile element. Notice that we have these two directional arrows on the leaves. Now, when we talk about an immobile element, once those elements get distributed to the plant, to the leaves, they're stuck there. The plant cannot reallocate those to different parts of the plant as needed. Some more vocabulary, chlorosis. When we talk about chlorosis, it's these, this yellowing, either a yellowing of the entire leaf or intervenal chlorosis that you see here on the right-hand side, but some type of yellowing to the leaf. Now that's converse to necrosis. Necrosis is some cell death, some browning, um, and it can be caused by a number of different things, but um, necrosis refers to death or browning of leaf tissue. Uh, just some examples of flower deformity. This, uh, this um, plant on the left, the flower, um, it's kind of curled a little bit. Um, it also is, is discolored. Uh, and then obviously the one on the right, not all the pe petals are formed. Um, this isn't a case of the petals fell off. Um, these petals just never formed. Some leaf distortion, some, um, these petunias on the left, you can see obviously these aren't uh, what you would expect. There's just some serious leaf distortion there or some leaf curling as we see here on the, on the lily. So we also have some speckling that can take, um, take effect. Um, and here we see this in, in these pansies that uh, you see this spotting of some kind of a necrosis across the leaf blade. So to, to move on, we're going to use a kind of like a dichotomous key um, for the first part of this, um, this presentation to, to be able to determine what the nutrient deficiencies are. Um, what the symptoms are. And a lot of you have probably used Economist Key to identify flowers or trees or birds, you know, field guides that are dichotomous keys. It asks you a, a two-part or a question with, with two possible answers. And depending on how you answer that question, it takes you down one path or the other. It's a very simple process of elimination. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to start by asking the right questions. And the first question that I always ask myself are, are you really dealing with a nutrient deficiency? And the way to determine that is to look for patterns or the lack of patterns within the greenhouse or the, or the flat of plants that you're looking at. 
So usually if it's an insect or a disease, what we call a biotic problem, it's typically no pattern is involved. But if it's a nutritional disorder or another environmental problem, we consider that an, an abiotic problem. There is a consistent pattern. I'll show you some, some examples of that. So here's a, just a line drawing. If, if we looked at that and if we folded this leaf in half, is there any symmetry? Is there a pattern? And we would generally say no, because the spot up at the top and the spot down at the bottom and those spots in the middle, they don't really line up um, when, we, when we fold that leaf in half. So we don't have uh, a pattern there, which leads us to think that it's, an abio or it's a biotic problem like an insect or a disease. Now let's look at another line drawing. And if we fold that leaf up, it's not perfect, perfect symmetry, but it's a lot better um, than the one before. We have the, um, the necrosis or the, or the um, lesions on the edges of this, the leaf, and it's almost symmetrical. So this, was, with this would be an abiotic disorder. Um, here again is, is some, some real plants in a greenhouse. And you notice that uh, it doesn't, if we fold this picture in half, it doesn't seem like there's symmetry um, or, or that there's a pattern. But if I told you that there's two different irrigation lines here, um, the one on the right with the lighter colored plants is on one irrigation zone and the one on the left is on another, then you would say like, aha, there is a pattern here. The entire crop is being affected. So um, this would be um, an abiotic factor. Here's a, a pot of petunias. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any symmetry. Two of the plants in the pot are unaffected. One plant is completely decimated and another plant, uh, we see some, some effects of, of whatever problems of afflicting this. So there's no symmetry. So this makes us think it must be a biotic factor and it was some type of a um, disease. Looking here, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a huge, or there is a little bit of a pattern, but this, this one can be tricky. Um, this is actually just a, a genetic sport, um, a mutation. Um, so there's a little bit of a pattern that it's always running down kind of one side of the leaf or the other, um, but it's not a biotic factor like an insect or a disease. Uh, here's a real common one with uh, poinsettias. And you notice, again, we don't see a pattern. There's a, a plant that's unaffected right next to a plant that's affected right next to another plant that's unaffected. There's, it's very random. So this is a biotic factor, a disease. Here on marigolds, all these plants have the same symptoms in the same place. There's lower leaf yellowing. Um, and if we looked at the whole crop, we would see that yellow leaf, um, lower yellowing of the leaves across the whole crop. It's not random at all. There's a pattern. So yes, um, this would be an abiotic factor, and in this case, it's a nutrient deficiency. So the next thing we want to ask ourselves is where do we see the symptoms on the plant? And this is where the mobile and immobile part of, of the elements come in pl play. If it's a mobile element, we see the symptoms on the base of the plant because the plant is prioritizing the younger tissue that is needing those nutrients and it reallocates the nutrients that are in the lower leaves of the plant up to the top of the plant. So those symptoms of nutrient deficiency show up at the base of the plant when it's a mobile element. Uh, and here you see um, some, this Kleomi, we're having the, the lower leaf yellowing. Um, it's a nitrogen deficiency and that plant is needing that nitrogen at the top of the plant and it's reallocating the nitrogen in the bottom leaves up to the top of the plant. Now, conversely, with an immobile element, we see the symptoms at the top of the plant. Uh, we see them start at the top of the plant, so they can't be reallocated from the lower leaves to the top of the plant where the plant needs it, so we start to see the symptoms at the top of the plant. Uh, and this is the classic iron deficiency uh, with Calibricoa. Um, the iron is needed at the top of the, the plant, the growing point, but the, the lower leaves cannot reallocate the iron up to the top of the plant, so those symptoms start at the top of the plant. And then finally, um, those elements, there's a couple elements that are partially mobile. They're not really efficient at being moved, but they can be moved. Um, so you sometimes see those in the middle part of the plant or the whole plant. Now, the important thing with this is, is that you really are honest with yourself of where did you see the symptom start? Not necessarily where did you see it now, two weeks after the symptoms um, 
presented themselves in the, in the first place, because at that point, it's probably going to work its way through the whole plant. But when did you first see those symptoms and where did they start? That's the key. Um, so oh, here's, a, here's an example of a partially mobile uh, element, sulfur. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, this plant is, has just an overall um, chlorotic look to it. And those symptoms all came together at the same time throughout the whole plant. So now that comes to what are the symptoms that we're actually seeing? Um, so we're going to break that up by, by the different um, mobility of, of the elements um, because now we're starting that process of elimination. We're not just pulling these symptoms and, and these um, diagnoses out of the air. It's a process of elimination. So let's go with the, the mobile elements. So at this point, we've decided that it is certainly an abiotic factor. We've, we've asked ourselves, is there a pattern to it? Is there any symmetry? And we've said, yes, there's a pattern so that we know that it's an abiotic factor. We're going to assume that it's a nutrient deficiency here. Um, the next question that we've asked ourselves here is where did we start seeing the symptoms? Did we see the symptoms at the top of the plant, the middle of the plant, or at the bottom of the plant? And with the mobile elements, we've answered that question that we first started seeing those symptoms at the bottom of the plant. So just with those few questions, we've narrowed it down to only four elements that can be a possibility, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. So now we need to look at the symptoms. And this is where it gets really tricky because when I was first introduced to nutrient deficiencies and the diagnosing these, and for years and years, people would explain them to me and I would see the same symptoms uh, recur over and over uh, and, it, and it just became overwhelming. And that's why we're taking this systematic approach of um, pulling out um, questions and the process of elimination. So we know that if, if on the bottom of the plant, if the symptoms that we see are uniform chlorosis, now we have narrowed it down to either nitrogen or potassium, or I'm sorry, nitrogen or phosphorus. And if we look at the, the symptoms for nitrogen and phosphorus, we see that uh, we have uniform chlorosis, stunting, early flowering, possible red color, or leaf abscission with nitrogen. And if we compare that to phosphorus, a lot of those seem to be the same symptoms. So what we're so you see that there's a lot of the same symptoms here that are um, that are highlighted. Now, if we disregard those ones and we look at the ones that are dis, that are unique to each one of those, those are the symptoms that we want to focus in on. So early flowering in nitrogen and leaf abscission, along with these other symptoms, and deeper green foliage initially, and fewer and longer roots with the, with the phosphorus. So let's look at nitrogen deficiency. So we have this uniform chlorosis starting at the bottom of the plant. Um, and when it progresses to a certain extent, uh, we will get some necrosis. Um, but if you look at, at this photo here, uh, we see some severe stunting with the, the plant on the right that doesn't, it didn't have any nitrogen. And you notice how far in flower uh, this, the one on the right without any nitrogen is compared to the control plant. Those flowers are, are all open, um, fully open compared to the, to the other ones that there's just some buds starting to sh show color and just one or two that are, are beginning to open. Um, so we have that early flowering. Uh, now looking at the, the phosphorus, um, we're looking at that deep green foliage and the fewer and, and longer roots. Uh, the, the plant on the right, um, this is the initial stage. You see a little bit of darker green color to those plants on the right that have um, phosphorus deficiency. Um, you can also get that purpling color. Um, that's a, a pretty distinct one, but it's not always the smoking gun um, because there's several other uh, deficiency symptoms that show some purpling or, or red color. Um, but if you take that plant out of the pot and it truly is phosphorus deficiency, a lot of times you'll see fewer roots and the roots that you do see are very long and slender. You don't have all those root hairs that you would expect to see. Now, if the deficiency symptoms that we're seeing on the lower part of the leaf is intervenal chlorosis, we've made it really easy. It's magnesium. It's the only one, only element that has that type of um, intervenal chlorosis on the bottom of the plant. Um, so just to give you a, a look at that, um, it's on the older leaves. Um, the, eventually, we will get some necrosis 
um, and again, some possible red, um, possible red coloration on the older leaves. But we're really interested in that chlor intervenal chlorosis on the on the older leaves. And this is these are the symptoms that we're looking at. You can see these chrysanthemums on the right. Um, you know, the, the upper part of the plant they look great, but then again at the bottom, we're starting to see that intervenal chlorosis. And then you see a close up of another plant on the left. You see the that kind of modeling the the chlorosis is is not across the entire leaf, but uh, it's just the intervenal portions of it. And, and again, some, some more looks at it uh, here on the left is, is pretty classic. You can see that the, the veins are still pretty dark green and the, the um, tissue in between the veins are turning chlorotic. And finally, with our mobile um, elements, we have um, potassium. So if we have the first symptom that we see is some type of a necrosis um, on the lower parts of the leaves, it's probably potassium. Um, you might see some chlorosis at the, at the tip or the margins of the leaves, but it's going to happen very quickly. It's going to rapidly turn to necrosis. Um, so that's the, the portion that we're really looking at. Uh, and here's some examples here, um, like on this wax begonia up here in the upper left-hand corner. Um, we never, you can see a little bit of, of chlorosis on those upper leaves um, on the margins, but it really went to a, a, a fast necrosis on those um, edges of the leaves. Um, and again, here on, on poinsettias, you see that marginal um, necrosis really coming in, and it really sticks to the, to the margin there. Uh, so that uh, sums up our, our mobile elements. Um, we're going to move on to our partially uh, mobile elements. Um, and uh, the first one is, is sulfur. You're going to see a uniform chlorosis over the entire plant. Um, you might see some um, necrosis, also some faded flower colors, um, and uh, the, the leaves or inner nodes might develop some red pig pigmentation. Now, a lot of people with uh, nutrient deficiencies really hone in on this red pigmentation because it's easy to, um, to identify. But if you've noticed, I've talked about two or three other elements that also can develop red pigmentation. So it's not always the best one to go by. So for sulfur, we're gonna look for that uniform chlorosis of the plant and the faded flower colors. Um, and here's another picture of sulfur, sulfur deficiency. We have stunted growth and that whole plant is just um, chlorotic. It didn't necessarily start at the top or start at the bottom. It all came across the entire plant at the same time. Um, and here's an example of it going to a very advanced stage and getting some necrosis on the, the leaf tip. Um, we also can see some, um, some flower color fading. Um, and this is tough because you have to know what you should be expecting. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is the, the necrosis again um, of the leaves. Um, and down here is, is the um, faded flower color. And you can see that the control on the, the left hand um, side of this photo is nice and deep purple. Um, and then you get a nice lavender as you go off to the, to the right. And this is important to know what cultivar you're expecting and look at the other symptoms too, uh, because that, that light lavender in the middle is not a bad color to look at. It, it, it could be a very desirable color, but if you're expecting the color that's a deep, rich purple, you know that something's not quite right. Now, molybdenum um, is, is pretty easy um, for the ornamental crops because the only ornamental crop that we have um, really seen um, molybdenum deficiency is in poinsettias. Um, so you can always be looking for that in poinsettias and don't really have to think about molybdenum too much in, in our other ornamental crops. And it's just a clear chloretic band around the leaf margin is, is a thing that we're really looking for. And sometimes this can, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, be mistaken for um, cycle cell damage because cycle cell damage looks very similar to this on poinsettias. But if you know you haven't applied any cycle cell uh, in the last week or so, and you're seeing this chlorotic band around the leaf margin, you know that you're dealing with molybdenum. All right, that's wrapped up uh, a little over half of our deficiency symptoms. Uh, we're going to move on to our non-mobile um, deficiency symptoms. So these are ones that we're going to see the first symptoms show up at the top of the plant. And if we see the top of the plant um, become chlorotic, um, for the first symptoms, we're going to be thinking about iron or manganese. 
If we have necro necrosis um, and distortion at the top of the plant, uh, it's going to be either calcium or boron. And then finally, if it's the most recently mature leaves, so that second rank of leaves up at the, the top of the plant is copper or zinc. So let's look at uh, iron and manganese um, first. Uh, again, if we look at these, um, these symptoms, they're very similar. So we're going to look at the, the things that are, are unique to each one of those, and that's the chlorosis that clears to yellow or white, um, and then necrosis for the iron, and then the tan flecking for, um, for manganese. So iron deficiency is probably the, the most, uh, um, uh, most uh, the deficiency that we see the most in greenhouses. It's um, pretty recognizable for most of us. It's the, um, that, that chlor intervenal chlorosis of the young tissue, uh, oftentimes associated with, with pH problems. But you know, if you've grown petunias or calabarcoa and Gerber daisies, most of us have probably seen iron deficiency at, at one time or another. Um, with manganese deficiency, um, you know, we get this tan flecking of, of, the, um, of the young tissue. So we see necrosis come in pretty quickly, much like we see the necrosis come in with the um, potassium, but this time it's at the top of the plant, not at the bottom of the plant. Um, so you can see these photos here that we kind of get this um, necrosis on the leaf margins a little bit, but really across the leaf, um, the leaf blade um, in, in this uh, kind of random pattern here. So um, calcium and boron, if we see necrosis or, um, and leaf distortion at the top of the plant, uh, we're, we're going to be thinking about these two elements. And as we have seen in the, with, with every element up until then here, that there's a lot of similarities between these two. So we want to look at the differences. Um, with the boron, we're also going to see, in, in addition to the distortion and the incomplete flower, um, uh, forma flower formation and the short, densely branched roots, we're going to see short internodes, um, thick leaves or corking with the boron deficiency, and even um, growing tip abortion and excess branching to the plant, almost as like it was pinched. Um, but let's look at calcium first. Um, this one you know, we see this leaf distortion. A lot of times you see with these two photos on the left-hand side, it almost looks like there's a drawstring at the base of that leaf. And somebody just pulled that drawstring up a little bit and curled the, the margins of the leaf um, up and, and into each other. And then as it progresses, oftentimes we'll see that um, necrosis at the tip of the plant. Um, we see the incomplete flower formation. Um, and, and really what this is, um, is a, a symptom that, that we are very familiar with, with tomato production, and that's blossom end rot. Uh, it's, it's the flower form, the, the flower, which it was at the end of this tomato, the, the blossom end of the, of the tomato, it rots away because we don't have the calcium in there to, to help with the, the cell structure, and, and we have that breakdown and um, that necrosis happening uh, on the fruit, or in our case, uh, we, we don't usually grow it all the way to fruit with our ornamentals uh, with that incomplete flower formation. And cork spot and apple is, is pretty common uh, calcium deficiency. We'll see those um, primary and secondary roots get are much shorter. As you can see, the, the plants here on the right um, have calcium deficiency associated with them. Uh, roots are shorter and, and have a, quite a few more branches on them. Now, if we look at uh, the boron deficiency, we see some of the same things, but um, our again our incomplete flower formation. The, the flower, the pansy flower on the right, has boron deficiency, um, and it's obviously not forming into the flower that we would expect. We have a oftentimes um, collapse of the flower stem that you see here in the in the tulips. And here's a, a real um, kind of a smoking gun for boron deficiency. Um, here it is in pansies. But it almost looks like same, somebody came and pinched the growing um, st uh, point out of this plant. And then we start to get some, some lateral shoots coming in. And in fact, we did get uh, an abortion of the, of the growing tip. It wasn't because somebody pinched it out. Is that the, the born wasn't there to complete that formation. And it died out. Apical dominance has been lost. And we get these proliferation of side shoots. Also, um, the the leaves become very brittle and corky. Um, if you feel in between your fingers, 
um, they're just much thicker and more brittle than, than what an unaffected plant would normally be. Um, with the bond efficiency, we get those um, thicker roots, kind of clubby roots uh, is what we call them sometimes, but fewer roots, um, those secondary roots, uh, just um, to, to pay attention to, to looking at the, the bottom of the, the pot. So that takes care of four of our immobile um, nutrients. We have two more, um, copper and zinc. Um, these ones uh, I don't really come across very often, um, not something that uh, um, we should be overly concerned about, but something that we should be aware of still. Um, so we're looking at the young and recently matured leaves. Uh, so not those newest ones that are still forming, but those, those ones that are just expanded just below that. So we have leaf curl, um, variable chlorosis with both of them, a rapid necrosis of the fully expanded leaves. So now we're looking at the, the difference between the two. And copper will get smaller, lighter colored flowers or no flowers at all. Um, and that's very similar with sulfur. We, we have that same um, scenario with sulfur, but we um, it's showing up on the, the most recently um, mature, or the most recently mature leaves with some of these other uh, symptoms, whereas with sulfur, it's coming to the whole plant. But let's take a look at some examples. We have this leaf roll here, um, and then here's the uh, um, the difference in the in the flower color. The one here on the left is copper deficient, and you can see it's it's much lighter um, purple. It's even pink. But again, you need to know what you're expecting because if this is the only symptom you see. Uh, you might not notice it unless you know that this cultivar that you're growing should have a dark purple um, flower to it. Um, you notice here there's no flowering on the copper plants <coughs> or the, the copper deficient plants. It's the same, same cultivar grown at the same time, but they're smaller and, and the flower is, has, the flowering just hasn't happened. Um, and here's something like with what I'm talking about with those recently matured leaves. Uh, the, the growing tip here at the top of the, the plant isn't really affected, but it's dropped all these leaves kind of in the middle of the stem and then the lower of the stem, again, the leaves aren't affected. Finally, let's look at zinc. Um, we get the curling chlorosis of the young leaves. A lot of times uh, I hear people calling this kind of mouse earring. If you can, this is an apple tree and if you think about it, it kind of looks like um, it's curled up and it looks like a little bit of like a mouse ear. Uh, and again, those small, those um, most recently matured um, leaves, the plant in the middle is, is the control and the two plants on either side are deficient in zinc. And you can see that middle section, those most recently um, matured leaves are the ones that are affected. So that sums up our um, kind of our key of our um, deficiencies, um, nutrient deficiencies. I haven't posted the, the handout yet. I apologize for that, but I'll get that on my website um, shortly um, later today so that you can download that. And uh, along with that, um, there'll be a one page sheet that kind of goes through um, this dichotomous key for these nutrient deficiencies. If you want to see more photos of a lot of different uh, bedding plants, there's this nutrient deficiency um, in bedding plants book that was uh, written by a number of people at NC State. Uh, you can buy this on amazon.com. It has a whole bunch of photo, full color photos of plants that were induced to have these different deficiencies so you can see what, what you can be expecting. So right now, um, before we, we're gonna take a quick little break, um, but before that, I wanna take any questions that any of you might have. So go ahead, um, there's a couple of, um, uh, questions here. Let me look at what we have. Okay, no, no questions yet. I'll give give you all a, a couple of questions, a couple of minutes to to get things um, um, typed in there. If you have any questions about this. So there's a couple questions early on that I didn't see about uh, um, listening or being muted. Uh, all of you are muted by the uh, um, by me, the organizer, um, so we don't hear any background noise. Um, 
All right, so it doesn't seem like there's any, um, any questions at this point. Um, oh, here we go. Now I got some. So the, the question is, um, tell the difference in iron and manganese. And uh, um, iron is going to have the, um, the intervenal chlorosis on the, the top part of the plant. That's going to be the um, kind of the, the telltale sign for that. And manganese is going to be on the top of the plant where we'll have that tan flecking. Um, some, so a little bit of necrosis that's um, throughout the band of, the, of the, the, the leaf blade. Let me see, there's a couple more questions. So, so the question is, would someone need to do a soil test in order to determine which mi mineral is deficient? And doing a soil test is one option um, to help you with the diagnosis. Um, and, and we'll go through that a little bit more in the, the next part of the, the webinar. But I usually look at a, a soil test as, or a substrate test as kind of a, a look into the future of what is available for the plant to take up um, as opposed to what has been available and what the plant has or hasn't been able to take up because um, the, depending on fertilize, fertilizer events and irrigation events, um, you might have applied the right uh, amount of nutrient to the plant. Um, it just hasn't been taken up to the, by the plant um, from the substrate. And that can um, be for a number of reasons. Um, and pH is one of them. And, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit in the next, next um, part of the, the seminar. Uh, let's see. I'm not going to be talking. There's a question about uh, highlight um, aggravating um, uh, magnesium deficiency. I'm, I'm not going to get into that at all in, in this webinar. So the, there's a comment that just some of the symptoms look almost identical. And I totally agree with you. And that's why we use this um, systematic approach that, uh, you know, you Iron deficiency and um, and and uh, nitrogen deficiency have very similar uh, uh, symptoms, but they just show up on different parts of the plant. Um, so there are some real key things that I've um, kind of underlined or highlighted throughout this webinar, and it'll be in my handout too. If you look at these key symptoms on specific parts of the plant, it starts to become um, much more clear. Uh, and then the, the last question is uh, why some why are some cations um, mobile and, and some immobile, um, and and that's not an answer that I have off the top of my head right now. I can um, look that up and and try to email that out if you would like me to. Um, so that's all the questions that we have now for this section. Um, it's uh, my clock says one thirty six right now. Um, so. How about um, we take about a four minute break? So at 1.40 in four minutes, uh, we'll start up with the second part of the webinar. Okay, everybody, um, my clock says 1.40. So as promised, we're gonna uh, keep moving on. Um, so we, we finished up our first section with, with symptoms and going through those symptoms and trying to identify those. Um, and just to, to let those know who maybe showed up a little bit late, um, we, we are recording this, so you will be able to, to watch this uh, webinar in the future. Um, and also, I do have uh, notes for this. I, I have the, the slide handouts, also a, a handout to, to help you with the keying of the symptoms. Uh, I apologize for not getting that uh, up on the the web prior to this webinar, uh, but I'll get it posted on my um, on my uh, website. That's nhfloriculture.com. I'll have that up on that uh, website later this afternoon. So we're going to continue on with the webinar, uh, and the next thing that I want to cover is the causes. What can cause some of these symptoms? Obviously, we know that it's probably some type of a nutrient deficiency, 
Um, but what's causing this, this nutrient deficiency is, is the next section that I want to go through. Um, so we talked a little bit about this earlier is trying to determine if it's an insect or a disease or a, um, a nutrient deficiency. Um, and um, I just want to show you a picture of this marigold that this does look a lot like uh, a nutrient deficiency. Um, this could look, be like a, a potassium um, deficiency with the necrosis on the, the edge of the leaves, on the older leaves. But in actuality, this is an insect problem. If we looked at this whole crop, um, we would see that there's, there's no real distinct pattern. It starts in one place and it's very random. Um, so um, I just want to bring back this, this message that just because it looks like a, a nutrient deficiency um, at the leaf level, you need to look at the whole crop and decide, is it really going to be a nutrient deficiency or is it an insect problem? Um, same goes with diseases. Um, here's some marigold or some, sorry, some geraniums. Uh, and they look very much like maybe a, a nitrogen deficiency. But again, you look and there's no real pattern to it. You see plants that are um, affected and non-affected right next to each other. Um, so um, we have a disease that's mimicking a, a nutrient deficiency symptom. Um, watering can cause nutrient deficiencies. Uh, getting waterlogged um, su substrate can, can inhibit the uptake of um, nutrients. Um, and here's a, a case where um, we have some iron deficiency uh, in this vinca. And a lot of us know that vinca doesn't really like to be held wet for very long. And then when it is held wet, uh, we, we slow down the, the metabolic processes that take up some of these um, elements. And, and we get that deficiency, even though the element is present in the substrate. And this is where we're going with where I was going with, with um, the substrate testing and the soil testing is if we did a soil test on this, we would see that there's enough iron in that substrate, but the plant's not taking it up. So it might not have been the best um, diagnostic um, technique to figure this out. So um, sum this up, our watering techniques can induce um, nutrient deficiency symptoms. Uh, when we, we look at the water itself, we look at water alkalinity and water pH, these can have effects on our, um, on our nutrient deficiencies. Now, we need to know what the difference between water alkalinity is and what water pH is. And water alkalinity is the amount of carbonates and bicarbonates um, dissolved in the water. And water pH is, the, is a measure of the hydrogen ions in your water. Um, and that leads us um, to, the, to the concept that water pH has very little effect on substrate pH. It might have a, a minor effect um, initially, um, but you can have a very high water pH. You can have a pH of, of seven, seven and a half, and not have much an effect on your um, substrate pH, depending on the fertilizer that you're using and, and depending on the amount of alkalinity that you have in your, in your water. So alkalinity is really what is driving uh, what's in our water, what is driving the pH of our substrate up or down. Um, and it's important to check that water alkalinity on a, on a regular basis. So the, the question that I get asked right after I, I say this is, well, what does it mean to check it regularly? And I guess that depends on the type of, of operation that you are. If you are a, a seasonal operation and only produce in the spring bedding plant crops, uh, if you do an alkalinity test at the beginning of the, the season, that's probably good enough. If you're year round and you're um, producing through this, the summer, fall, and, and winter, probably every six months, once in the winter, once in the summer, will give you an idea because alkalinity can change with the seasons depending on uh, where your water source is coming from um, and the availability of water You know, in, in case of a well. And if you're from a municipality, uh, if your water is coming from a municipality, they might be pulling water um, from a number of different sources any given day, and alkalinity can change but it's just a good idea to know uh, that baseline of alkalinity. And an alkalinity test, you send it out to a lab, is probably going to cost somewhere between $30 and $40. So it's not going to break the bank, and it can save you from a whole lot of heartache um, and headache if, if you uh, know what you're dealing with your water alkalinity. Temperatures. If you have improper temperatures with your, with your um, crops in your greenhouse, um, those can mimic some, um, some nutrient deficiency symptoms. Here's a marigold crop. This 
this grappa is growing um, very cold and you know you see this purpling on the, the lower leaves it's it's one of those symptoms that most of us associate with phosphorus deficiency and in fact if you took a tissue sample of this it would be phosphorus deficiency um, but it probably isn't because there's no phosphorus in this in the substrate it's because the temperatures in the greenhouse are too low um, the substrate the the physical and chemical properties of the substrate can have a huge effect on um, nutrient uptake and, and the um, presentation of, of symptoms. Here in this poinsettia crop, we, we see some symptoms that look pretty, pretty classic as a nitrogen deficiency. But if I, as I started to talk with this grower, um, I, I was realizing what was really happening. If you notice the lip of that substrate um, compared to the, to the top of that pot, it's, it's been compressed quite a bit. But, um, the, the plant, the, or the physical properties in that substrate had been broken down um, due to in, improper handling of the substrate and it compacted down and there's not enough air space in that pot uh, for, the, for the roots to get enough oxygen. So it, it decreased its ability to take up nitrogen and we're starting to see nitrogen deficiency. Even though there is adequate nitrogen in the substrate, that substrate was compacted and, and there's low air volume in that substrate. Um, as opposed to the, the root ball on the right, you see some nice pore space and some good healthy roots and that geranium crop is, is doing really well. The fertilizer itself can be, it's, can be a problem. Not all fertilizers are supplying um, all the elements. It's, they're not all complete um, fertilizers. So we need to, to look and make sure that um, the symptom that we're seeing um, doesn't coincide with the element that's uh, missing from our fertilizer. There can be antagonisms. Um, some uh, elements are competing for uptake by the plant um, with another element. So if we have an excess amount of potassium, calcium deficiency can, can occur. If we have an excess amount of nitrogen, um, also calcium deficiency. And if we have an excess amount of calcium, we can have a, a deficiency in magnesium. And so we want to kind of look at a ratio of, of a um, potassium, calcium, magnesium ratio of four to two to one in our fertilizer mix um, to try to keep those in balance so we don't run into antagonisms. Um, there's, uh, all fertilizers are, are either potentially acidic or potentially basic. And this, along with water alkalinity, will drive the pH of our um, substrate up or down, depending on if it's potentially acidic, it has the potential to lower the pH. And if it's potentially basic, it has the, the potential to raise the pH of the crop. And depending on the crop and, and what it likes to grow in, it can cause us problems because we've, we've all seen this chart where we see the pHs, uh, ranges, and, and what the um, element availability at dif these different pH ranges are. And we usually try to um, recommend that growers keep their pH somewhere between like a 5.5 a to a 5.8 or, or, or 6.0 because that's kind of the sweet spot where the most of the elements are available at, at a um, maximum level or at least a, an ideal level. And we get outside of that and we start to run into some problems one way or the other. Um, checking the, the pH and EC of our substrate is, is really key because of that. Um, also, the EC or the electrical conductivity is the amount of um, dissolved salts in our, um, in our water or in the um, soil solution. And if the EC gets too high, we might run into a problem um, that we see here with these mums. Um, this can be mistaken for a, a nutrient deficiency, but in actuality, it's just um, fertilizer burn. That there's too much salt buildup in the substrate. And the plants taking it up and um, becoming necrotic where those salts build up. Uh, we can use our pH and EC meter to um, calibrate our injector because if our injector is not working right, we're not getting the fertilizer to the plants that we expect. Um, checking our substrate pH, which I already covered, so that uh, we're falling in that 5.5 to 6.0 range for most of our crops. Um, and then the substrate pH, like I mentioned with, the, uh, um, with these mums here. So um, when it comes down to it, usually the cause of our symptoms um, can usually be um, 
placed into one of these categories. Is it caused by an insect or disease and not a nutrient deficiency at all? Um, if it is a nutrient deficiency, um, something to do with our water, whether it's um, the pH or, the, or really the alkalinity of our water or the frequency of our watering, um, the temperature of our greenhouse or the temperature of our substrate um, in the, uh, that the roots are in, the type of fertilizer that we're using, does it have the right amount of fertilizer of, or one element versus the other element? Is it missing an element? Um, is it potentially acidic or basic? And is that matched for our, uh, our water um, test um, with our alkalinity? And then what's the pH and the EC of our, of our substrate? Um, is that off or is um, the, the EC of our fertilizer water coming out of our injector correct? Is our injector correctly um, calibrated? So those are the causes. Now we need to um, have a systematic process because we have a systematic process of trying to figure out what deficiency we're working at with our symptoms. Uh, we've looked at our causes. Now, what's the process of troubleshooting which one of these causes is, um, is making our symptoms present themselves? And so that's our, our next part of our, our presentation here. And when I see a nutrient deficiency and I've decided which nutrient deficiency it is, one of the first things that I ask, and just about every time a grower calls me or emails me uh, with a problem, the first question I always ask myself or ask the grower is, what's the pH and what's the EC? If you don't know that as a grower and, and, and you call your extension specialist, chances are good that that's the first thing that they're going to ask you. And, and you're, they're going to ask you to go back into the greenhouse and do a, a substrate test. And it doesn't matter if you use a pour through or a two to one method or a saturated media extract SME, um, but you do need to let us know um, which method you use because that can um, skew the numbers one way or the other. Um, and my recommendation is to, to choose one of these methods and stick to it and always use it so that you get efficient at it and you get used to the numbers um, that you're obtaining from it. But um, the first process, the, the first thing that I want to know within this process of diagnosing um, the, the cause of our nutrient deficiency is what's, what's the pH and the EC of our substrate. The next thing that I do that is all too often um, neglected is looking at the roots. Um, the roots can tell you so many things about what's going on with the top of the plant. If I turned the plant over and I saw this root ball and these pansies um, and saw that, as a, definitely there's not any problem with the, with the substrate, um, physical properties or watering or whatnot, those root, roots look great. There's something else um, causing this problem. Now, if I look over on the right, this happens to be a geranium plant. I look at that and that root ball looks horrible. If you, if you look at it, those roots are brown. Um, there's not a lot of roots on it. Um, that substrate is so wet. Um, so you know, there's a disease here. It's, it, it's probably pythium and that, that root ball is just waterlogged. So there's a number of different things that is causing the nutrient deficiency in this case. The next thing, um, if I haven't found my smoking gun yet, I look at the fertilizer injector. Is it working properly? And there's a real easy way to, to um, tell that on just about every fertilizer label you're going to see a, a table that looks like this table up on the right hand, upper right hand corner of the slide. And uh, the first column says EC. And if you have 100 parts per million, you should get an EC of um, 0.74. Um, so you can use your EC um, meter to check the EC of the fertilizer water coming out of your injector to see if you have the, if your injector is working properly. Um, there's a, a few nuances that you need to, to go through. You need to um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but not much. It takes about um, five minutes to, to do this test. Um, to see an in-depth process of, of this um, fertilizer injector calibration, if you go to my website, nhfloriculture.com, um, you can learn more. You can find a video that goes through um, that injector calibration process. You can also just um, type into YouTube Greenhouse fertilizer injector calibration, um, and that, that video of mine should come up. Um, and we also have it on the eGrow um, uh, University website as well. Um, so the other thing with the fertilizer injector is, is the fertilizer mixed up correctly? Uh, I, uh, I have worked at a greenhouse where we had the, 
um, fertilizer recipe written in Sharpie on the wall next to the injector. Um, but, uh, you know, so many pounds of, of fertilizer and so many pounds of this fertilizer. But our fertilizers had changed over the year and nobody had, had changed the, the marquee um, recipe on the, the fertilizer or on the, on the wall. Or we changed barrels. We changed our different size of barrel that we were mixing our stock solution in. So the recipe is not being made correctly. So there's um, two causes um, that, that I always go through with my process to, to eliminate those. Check the fertilizer injector calibration and make sure that the grower is, is mixing their fertilizer up the way um, they, they intended to mix it up. If you need a little bit of help with that, um, um, Brian Whipker and I have come up with uh, this program called FertCalc. It's also on, on my website, nhfloriculture.com, that will help you um, come up with the recipe to, to mix up your fertilizer stock solution so you don't have to do the math. The computer will do it for you. Um, paying attention to the weather. Um, are you seeing a, a deficiency symptom? Um, I'll go back and, and look at what the weather has been like. Has it been really sunny? Has it been really cloudy? Have the temperatures accidentally dropped in the greenhouse because the furnace went out? Or did somebody turn the thermostat down um, too low for the night temperatures um, and, and we're trying to grow those plants at a too warm or too cold um, scenario for that crop and then um, might be le lending it to have those deficiency symptoms. The substrate. Um, how is the substrate handled? Um, many times I see this, this example here on the lower right-hand corner where uh, when we have some downtime, we'll, we'll fill our pots and our flats, and we'll stack them on a pallet and, so that they're ready for us when we need to transplant and our plants come in. And there's nothing wrong with that, but if you notice these plants are, or these pots are nested together um, and the close-up here on the right, you see that uh, they're compressed. We're running into that same situation, which I showed you earlier with that poinsettia, is we've lost all the, the air holding capacity of that substrate, and that plant is going to get waterlogged really fast. And then you, on the upper hand, or the top part of the slide, you can see this played out um, later in the season, where uh, we run into this endless process of spot watering because some of the plants are waterlogged because the, we lost all the air holding capacity, they don't dry out. Some aren't, and we have this inconsistency. So looking, looking back to how the substrate was handled, um, what the quality of the substrate was uh, when it went into the pot um, can also be um, the cause. And a question that I'm always asking myself as I'm going through this process of trying to determine why we're having this nutrient deficiency problem. Um, and that leads into our watering practices. How are these plants being watered? Um, you know, the, the plant here on the left, it just dried down. Somebody missed it. And uh, we're seeing the necrosis on the edges of the leaves. Can be mistaken for a nutrient deficiency. But if we think back to the, the last few days or the last week, um, we can remember, oh, we saw that wilting. And now five days later, we're seeing this necrosis as it's starting to grow back. Or um, here with this geranium plant on the, the bottom right-hand corner, it didn't get fully watered. So it didn't get as much fertilizer in that pot as what we had anticipated. It, we, we have half of the pot being um, saturated, half of the pot not, didn't get a full dose of fertilizer. Uh, up here on the, the top right, some plants are really sensitive to cold water. Um, this plant had overhead irrigation applied to it and the water was really cold and uh, we um, had some damage from that cold water. It's not a nutrient deficiency, it's just that cold water um, having, a prop, having an effect on the leaves. Also with watering um, is the force that's being used from the hose breaker. And, and here's a telltale sign that somebody was watering this with too much force. All the um, perlite is pushed to one side of the flat. So they were coming at one angle with a lot of um, pressure on that hose and making all the perlite float and push off to the side. And that pressure not only like made that perlite move off to the side, but over time, you're gonna compact that substrate and probably run into a problem with nutrient deficiencies because all that airspace is gone. So um, the, the last thing that I'll 
that I go that I have with the process um, that I, I lost my slide for that is a tissue test. If I haven't figured out um, what the problem is um, to this point, I, I will start going down the, the line of a tissue and a, um, a substrate test. Um, but those take you know probably a, a week at best to get those results back. Um, they can be expensive over time, um, and they don't and they don't always give us the answers. So that's always my last resort to go to the the tissue and um, substrate test for for nutrient analysis. Usually, if I go through this process that I went just went through, um, I can usually find the problem um, within one or more of those areas before I need the the tissue tests. Um, so the the last part of this whole process is practice. Um, this is not something that you're just going to pick up today and just feel 100% confident after this webinar. Um, you have to um, put this in the process, get this, um, this systematic process in your head and run through it on a, on a regular basis. Uh, when I was, before I was, um, or when I was a grower and then when I first started grad school, I'd see these extension specialists from around the country. They would just click off these answers just so fast. Um, and it just boggled my mind because I thought they were just they were just that smart and they're pulling that answer just out of thin air and they just knew it right off the top of their head. But um, as I spent more time um, through grad school and with, with these specialists and picking their brain, I realized that they're going through this process that I just explained, whether it's the symptoms or the process of diagnosis of, of what is causing the process or the, the problem, they're going through this um, but they've just done it so many times that it becomes very quick in their heads and it appears that they're just pulling it out of the thin air. So don't let us fool you. Um, we're, we're not as smart as we like to think we are. Um, we're going through this process um, very quickly because we, we do it on a very regular basis. So that um, finishes up um, this second and last half of the, uh, of the webinar. Um, so uh, happy to take some more um, some more questions. Um, there was a, a, one question that came in about uh, using sulfuric acid to control pH of, uh, and the high alkalinity in their water. Um, and they have an alkalinity of it looks like 270 parts per million. Um, can that cause a, a sulfur overload? Um, and it, it, it really shouldn't. Um, 200 parts per million alkalinity is um, is high, but it's not uh, abnormal depending on the t part of the country that you're in. Um, and using sulfuric acid to, to reduce your, your alkalinity, to, to um, neutralize your alkalinity, shouldn't cause a sulfur overload. And uh, um, Brian Whipker might be able to speak a little bit better to this with, with uh, nutrient toxicities, but uh, um, sulfur is not a toxicity that uh, um, comes up very often. So the, the other question was uh, in regards to the that picture of Vinca that I showed that had the iron deficiency. Um, they asked if the roots were damaged or not necessarily damaged to cause that. Um, and, and no, they're not necessarily damaged. It's just um, because it's, it's waterlogged and it has too much water in that substrate and the Vinca doesn't appreciate that, um, we, it just slows down the, the metabolic activity of those roots to, to be able to pull the um, the nutrients out of the, the substrate. All right. Um, so how does pH, how does the water pH have very little effect on the substrate pH? Can you explain this? Um, and I'll, I'll do my best without having any visuals here. Um, but the, the water pH um, is just a very weak um, uh, force on the on the substrate as compared to the potential acidity or put potential acidity of um, of your fertilizer or the alkalinity. Um, it, for all practical reasons, um, alkalinity is really um, a lime application to your fertilizer or to your to your substrate. So when you have a high alkalinity and you apply that over time, uh, what you're really doing is is adding lime to your substrate every time that you're you're irrigating. Uh, uh, 
several questions about the printed guidelines um, for taking a tissue test. Um, I don't have any printed guidelines, but I do have a video for that. Um, also, uh, it'll, you'll find it in the same places that you found the um, fertilizer injection um, calibration, either on my website, nhfloriculture.com, um, or it will be on the um, eGrow University website. Uh, Brian Whipper typed in, and he said he's never seen sulfur toxicity. Uh, the, another question is, how quick can you expect some of these nutrient deficiencies to correct themselves once the appropriate action is taken? Um, and I don't think I have a really good guideline for, for that. It, it's, it's, a, it's really going to depend on the crop that you're growing, the um, deficiency problem that you're having, and how you correct it. You know, if it's something like a nitrogen deficiency and the plant is actively growing, and it's just as simple as the plant wasn't getting enough nitrogen because the injector wasn't working, you know, you'll probably see uh, a change in, in a, you know, four or five days or, or, or you know, certainly within a week. Uh, if it's something uh, um, more dramatic than that, uh, it's, it's really going to depend. Question about uh, what is the most practical pH or EC meter for a grower to carry with them? Uh, I, I've used a, a couple of different ones that I really like. Um, I like the, the Hanna. Um, um, 98, uh, 13 meter. It's the, the meter that I showed a picture of there. That's a really nice one. Um, that, that's what I, I like to use a lot. Um, it's not very handy to hold with you all the time. It doesn't fit in your pocket. Um, but spectrum meters makes a, a couple of really nice pH and EC meters that, that fit in your pocket really nice. Uh, Hannah does make a, a couple of small pH and EC meters that, that will fit in your pocket as well. So yes, the, the website that I've uh, um, been referencing is nhfloriculture.com. All right, so there, there's a question about the, does anything mimic iron deficiency? Um, as, as far as another deficiency symptom, you know, something like a, a, a magnesium or a, a nitrogen deficiency, the symptoms look very similar, but they show up on, on different parts of the plant. Um, uh, and also, as I showed, you know, that the, um, having plants that are kept too wet can often mimic a iron deficiency, even though um, it, it's not actually iron, that, um, a deficiency in iron. So I, I think that's all the time that we have. Unfortunately, maybe some of you have, have heard that the, the daily um, leaf blowing from campus facilities is, is starting up again today outside my, my office window. So um, in lieu of uh, keeping that noise to a minimum, I think I'm going to uh, stop the, the webinar. I want to thank you all for um, participating in the webinar today. Um, please uh, uh, email us with any questions. Um, be, be on the lookout for our webinars on the eGrow website, the recordings. And uh, we, our plan is to have uh, about one webinar a month um, through the spring. Uh, we're going to skip uh, uh, December because of holidays. Um, but you will see more webinars from, from eGrow.com. So thank you all very much.